Beck. So before uh, we start with the exams, we have uh, uh, an experimentalist exam perspective uh, on uh, what Jorge has been uh, telling us. So uh, please, Maesh. Thank you. This is like reliving my PhD defense. <laughs> well, at least a part of it. OK, so I am doing this ex tempo. I haven't had time to collect my thoughts or anything. And uh, I did this experiment as part of my PhD thesis because I was extremely disappointed with the state of turbulence. It's called the graveyard of theories, the last unsolved problem in classical physics, so on and so forth. And one of the committee members went at me. The evening before, I sent a kind reminder to all my committee members about my thesis defense. And he had responded, I assure you I will be there and I will be on fire. So I said, thank you for letting me know. I'll bring, an, bring a fire extinguisher. <laughs> so which was my way of saying, you want to pick a fight, pick a fight with someone your size. Why do you want to show your strength on a student? Uh, but it became clear as the defense went on, uh, his beef with my thesis was that I had written an entire def a PhD thesis on turbulence without ever mentioning the Navier-Stokes equation. Who's he? Sorry, can you repeat? Daniel Boyanovsky. He, he was a professor. At, he still is a professor at Pittsburgh. Yeah. And, and uh, very nice person after the defense. <laughs> but until then, he was terror. And uh, he said, uh, so he said, how can you write a PhD thesis without the Navier-Stokes equation in it? I said, that is the point of it. What has the Navier-Stokes equation taught me about turbulence? I don't learn much from it. Anyway, so we were going back and forth. And at some point, my advisor took me out of the room and said, just defend and get out of here. <laughs> so uh, about fluctuation relations. How does an experimentalist approach it? And this is partly philosophical and partly the experimentalist's dilemma, because we can't measure everything. And this is the point I was making in my first slide in my lecture the first day. It is important for an experimentalist to know the requirements that went into the development of the theory and the assumptions that went into it, the limits under which the theory works, if you want to construct a viable test of that theory. Just as for a good theory, it is important to keep in mind what are the physical observables that are experimentally measurable. We can't measure everything. Computational digital experiments can do a bit better, but only so much more better. So we have gone through Jorge's uh, lectures, developing it from equilibrium, going through linear response to the driven nonlinear regimes. And we have arrived at the fluctuation relation. And when the first fluctuation relations were discussed by the various dramatis personae that uh, Jorge mentioned, one of the problems for the experimentalists was, OK, this, this looks exciting because this is the first time in so many decades that we have some important looking result that we can say something non-trivial about non-equilibrium regimes, because we don't have much of a theory. But the problem was we can't measure entropy production rate. So what can we measure experimentally that works as a proxy for entropy production rate? So we will start with some quantity that I will call x of t. It could be anything. I will constrain it further later on. And let's say this is the system. I'm not saying what is the system. It could be, and there have been many systems on which the fluctuation theorems or fluctuation relations have been tested. We are measuring some quantity. We are putting energy into the system at some steady state. So we are forcing the system. And the system is doing some work. And there is some dissipation. And all of the dynamics is somehow subsumed in some signal I'm measuring as an experimentalist. I will call that signal x of t. All I get is some time series. So uh, the system is at constant temperature t. No. I'm not even getting into temperature. OK. OK. I'm doing it in a room at constant temperature. But when I get to the end of it, 
and this is one of the reasons I left fluctuation relations. It doesn't give me a meaningful value for temperature. That is my problem with fluctuation relations. So now, Jorge gave this uh, correspondence between the ensemble picture and the time domain picture, how we can think about switching back and forth between them. Now, if I want to measure the entropy production rate, which I cannot really in experiments, I want a proxy for it. So it has to be something related to the entropy production rate. And Jorge already gave us one such quantity, the power, F dot V. Okay. So if I'm putting force into the system and I'm getting some quantity out of it, okay, so X of T could be power. It could be the energy dissipation rate, which is also a power. In other words, in the non-equilibrium stationary state, the rate of energy injection, that is the power put into the system, is on average the same as the energy dissipation rate. So I could I, either I could measure the fluctuations at the input end or at the output end, or within the system. Input end is not going to make much sense because I am by fiat fixing a constant energy injection. So what makes sense is I measure some quantity here or I put some probe here and measure the power at the output and the dissipation side. Now, the time. If I want to do the averaging, so according to the protocol that was established by the fluctuation relations, we are, if I have a time series, then I have some distribution for it. So I don't know the shape of the form of the functional form of the distribution. It could be a Gaussian, it could be something else, exponential, anything. I don't, I'm saying nothing about it. Usually it cannot be a Gaussian. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, what the fluctuation relation is saying that if I take this quantity x of t, I'll put t prime, dt prime, and I integrate it over some period tau, and I'll call this x sub tau. The, the fluctuation relation is saying that, and I could plot distributions of this time average quantity, right? So as the averaging time tau increases, as Jorge explained, this is going to be increasingly peaked. This is, so let's say this is tau small. This is so that was tau small. That is tau intermediate. And this is tau large. I'm not defining what is small, what is large just yet. It has all it, it has to be relative to something. So what is that something? That is the first question the experimentalist asks. Which is another way of saying if I have to average, what is the range of this time window over which the averaging occurs? The fluctuation relation says that the choice of the time window tau should be less than the correlation time of your system, of that signal. Which means if I calculate x of t, x of t plus t prime, So this is the autocorrelation, which I'm plotting on the y-axis as a function of t prime. And it's going to decay in some manner to 0. That is, that is the time, the area under this curve is the duration over which the, 
signal is losing memory of its past. So tau has to be smaller than the correlation time, but much it should be many sampling times. So you have to pick your sampling time of, of your signal fast enough that you have several samples within the averaging time. The more samples you have, the better, because you get, you get to construct more and more distributions to test this over several values of tau. Now, the trouble experimentalists ran into, that there are several beautiful papers by Sergio Ciliberto, Narayan and Menon on granular matter. Ciliberto did experiments in turbulence on resistors, current carrying conductors with a resistor, with a very high value of resistor which fluctuates because of changes in the air current which cools down the resistor momentarily. So you get, there were various systems in which this was tested. So now the statement of the fluctuation relation from following from here is that if my time averaged x, x sub tau, takes a value plus a, the ratio of that to x of tau taking the value minus a. So I'll now blow up this distribution for simplicity. So when I plotted my histogram and normalized it, I got several points. That means I need lots of statistics to be able to have a PDF of this quantity. So this is x sub tau, this is probability, density function. So I normalize the histogram and I have the PDF. This is 0. Let's say that is the most probable value, but that is not what we are concerned about. We are concerned about fluctuations. So I look at this quantity versus this quantity. So if I call this x sub tau taking the value plus a, so if this is plus a, then this would be minus a. If this is plus a, this would be minus a, right? It goes in a particular way. And that particular way, which Jorge proved for us in the context of entropy production rate, not for x of tau, it goes as e to the tau times a times some quantity sigma, which we call the entropy production rate, right? I should call this x sub tau. Am I right? Something is wrong. Something is wrong because we know the left hand side is dimensionless and the right hand side should also be dimensionless. So what is wrong? So if a is sigma, you would get, if x is sigma, sorry, you would be the sigma. Yes. Here, this is coming out as the entropy rate yeah. and so, so, so. X should be the entropy, some entropy goes up. So if there's only x without the sequence. Since this is not an entropy rate, it won't come out as such. That is the problem. Uh, just give me a moment. So this is where I have to go back and No, that, so far it's correct. So, I can now write this as that means if I plot the left hand side, so I'll just call this the LHS as a function of x sub tau, so this should go as a straight line. That, that was one way that Jorge showed us that the fluctuation relation is verified, tested. And the slope would come out to be sigma, which is interpreted as the entropy production rate. This is the way the experimental computation works because we don't have access to the entropy rate directly. I am aware of only one experiment that was able to do it that way. So otherwise, we always work with power. We always work with dissipation. 
So either it is F dot V or uh, torque times the uh, RPM, the revolutions per minute, angular velocity, or uh, I squared R uh, or V squared over R for electrical power. So th that is the quantity that is always available to the experiment. Uh, but sorry, but uh, so if the entropy production is uh, larger, which means that I'm driving the system faster, then uh, the prob that probably the distribution should be more peaked. Is this right? Yes. Is there uh, an intuition for this? Uh, I, I would imagine that uh, it should be broader because the fluctuations are larger. So you're saying as the system size increases or no, as I mean, the system uh, is driven harder? I, I'm saying you are measuring X, okay? And now uh, you are driving your system with F. Now, if the entropy production is zero, then uh, you should get uh, uh, that your X is... Uh, more or less. Uh, now, if your uh, if your entropy production is large, I would imagine that your fluctuations in X should be larger. Yes. So, and that's not what you get there, because there you get that if sigma is large, so sigma acts like tau. If no, that ta, if sigma increases, then uh, no. the distribution sh the is difference sharper. The difference arises in the following sense: if the forcing is increasing, the fluctuations will increase, and the sigma will change. Sigma will get steeper. The slope will increase. But under your condition, I keep the forcing constant, so I'm getting a certain magnitude of fluctuations. But because I'm averaging over a different tau, I'm smoothing the fluctuations. And therefore, I should get a different sigma. No. The system did not change. So whatever... Oh, yes. The sigma... Uh, I, I, I only say that the dependence on sigma there is, is a little bit strange. So I would put it maybe in the denominator. And then it's also... There is also an issue of dimensions there, yes. no? Uh, it's still bothering me, and I need to figure out why. Sigma times tau times x of tau. Ah, yes, I understand why. Because of this. I did not complete this definition. If this is divided by the same quantity in the limit that tau goes to infinity. So this is a dimensionless quantity. Sorry. We have to take the full long time average of the signal we got, which is to say this signal should have ex extended over, over several, several correlation times. So this, this experiment has to run very long. It has to sample very fast so that you have several points within a correlation time. And you need several correlation times so that you can reliably build a PDF. Now the dimension part is OK. But it still does not satisfy your other question. And I maintain that whatever physics is there is subsumed within this sigma, which we can only, which falls out of the analysis. We, we, we don't have a way to predict what is the value of sigma in experiment a priori. In very rare cases, we can do that. No, no, but this I understand, this I understand. So, but say, can, can one say that, uh, okay, you, you do this experiment, you measure x of t, then you do uh, 1 over t logarithm of the ratio of the probabilities, and then you find a straight line. And then uh, let's discuss about the, the, the slope, how the slope is related to entropy production. Yes. So let's, let, let me do it slight, let me backtrack a bit. I have moved the tau back here. I haven't done this. So let's say this is the left-hand side, which I'm plotting. If I were to plot this, I would get a family of straight lines for, for each tau. So this could be for one tau. This is for two tau, three tau, or 
let me call it C so correlation times. So when my tau runs four correlation times, three correlation times, two correlation times, as the tau changes, the slope will change. But that change in the slope is systematic because it is coming from this and not from this, which is why we always plot it this way so that all the curves will fall on one master curve. So the sigma does not change due to the coarse graining that is coming from the choice of the averaging time, tau. Is that, does that answer your question? No, that is no, still no. not your question. Well. <laughs> then I haven't understood the question. Is, uh, no, I mean, the question is, you made, uh, okay, so the, my first question is, what is the statement? So the statement is that uh, when you measure one over tau logarithm of this ratio probability, you get a straight line. This is an experimental fact. Yes. Or is a theoretical fact? No, well, that is where the, theoret the experimental verification corresponds to the theoretical fact. Or the theoretical prediction. Is it a theoretical prediction? Uh, so, bigger. you can. This version of the <coughs> theorem, I have to check it. Hi, yes. Uh, with an A that is not entropy production, I have to check it. Um, it's unfamiliar to me, but. Um, let me check it and I'll come to you tomorrow. But uh, if A is entropy production, then there is no doubt. Or power or something. So there was one, only one experiment that was designed such a way that you would be measuring the entropy production rate. Yes, 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 yes. But some assumption has to enter yes. the game, yes. and I have, to, I have to see what exactly the assumption is. You're right, and I don't remember those assumptions after all these years. Yeah. In fact, there are two assumptions. One was, when Galavati first presented this result, I don't know what meeting, because I was not a student of physics by then. This is a story I have heard from my PhD advisor. There was a lengthy discussion about, from the experimentalists, they said, we cannot measure this. If, because it was a global measurement. And if you are measuring the signal for a global system, it's a globally averaged quantity, you are never going to see violation of the, uh, uh, the violation uh, of, the, uh, of the signal, signal violating the second law momentarily. So then Galavati apparently went back and rederived it, and it was called the local fluctuation theorem. You, would, you are the expert on this. The one that was explained to me by Galavati was the local fluctuation relation, which I then went and tested. Yes. Uh... Okay. As far as I know, the locals never, uh, you need very special assumptions. They're not generically okay. true. But I understand perfectly well that people wanted something local because global quantities fluctuate very little, no? This is why thermodynamics is useful. Uh, unless you have a, unless you have a tiny, tiny. Oh. So this is where the experimentalists come to the theorists' conference and split hairs saying, on what basis can you equate the Evans, Seals, Morris uh, uh, fluctuation relation with the galavati cohen fluctuation relation versus the Jarzinski equality? Because it is relatively easier for the experimentalist to see more violation events when you are working with a microscopic system or a system with very few degrees of freedom. As the number of degrees of freedom of the system increased, of course, the number of fluctuations will die down, and you will have globally averaged smooth quantities. Then we are not going to see these violation events so easily. So, Amash, for example, uh well, I remember the Bustamante uh, experiments where essentially X was the work done uh, pulling uh, DNA or say, yes. in, uh, say opening uh, There the temperature makes sense. Ah, okay, okay. Because so you are, you are saying that, but there essentially, it was essentially, was measuring work. It was measuring yes. a very specific thing, uh, yes. which one knows. Yes. See, there measuring the work makes sense because you have a handle on what the temperature. The temperature you're using there is the thermodynamic temperature. Take turbulence. 
you are driving the system hard deep into the non-equilibrium, non-linear regime. If I were to back calculate and ask what temperature do I get through the fluctuation relation, I'll get something nonsensical like 10 to the 19 Kelvin. The water should have evaporated, ionized, and turned into plasma by then. It makes no sense. So I have asked often, what have I learned from the fluctuation relation about the system I'm using it to verify that I did not know before? What I'll, so from the experimental standpoint, here is what I have learned. In the first line of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, he's, he writes, every family is happy for the same reason, but every family is unhappy in its own way. We have a very sophisticated theory that explains equilibrium statistical mechanics to us. It has been applied with such mathematical sophistication to very difficult problems like critical phenomena and phase transitions and renormalization. We don't have any such handle for systems that are out of equilibrium. We have results when the system is nominally removed from thermal equilibrium or in the linear response regime. But when we, are, when we go deep into the non-equilibrium regime like a turbulent flow, we have no handle. What the fluctuation relation says is, no, there is a method to the unhappiness of every family also. That is to say, even though the symmetry breaking in the time reversal is happening, it is happening, the symmetry breaking itself is happening in a systematic manner. It's not every system to itself. There is a method to this madness. Where the fluctuation relation falls short in helping the experimentalist is when I try to pull out what is the analog of a temperature for this strongly driven nonlinear system, I don't get a useful answer. That means the thermodynamic description is not so easy to push forward into the non-equilibrium non regime which, of course, the theorists already knew, because if they hadn't, they would have figured out the theory by now. Yes, so I'll give you one example. The way, that, the way that you choose x and minus, and minus x was to what we, we have done in, in, the, in class. It because it, it pick a, a proxisma in this axis and minus sigma in the other axis. And you, in your case, you pick, like on your distribution, you pick two different points. And you say that this point is plus, plus a and, two, and this point is minus a. It's not a, very so different. What, he, what Jorge explained and what I did. So. So what Professor Kurchan explained was in the analytical uh, derivation and the physical intuition that goes with it. The experimentalist always has to discretize stuff. We don't have anything continuous, right? So the discrete form of that is if this is 0, then all the part of the this left tail of the probability density function, so this is what I'm calling x sub tau, and this is the probability density function of x sub tau. So the probability that it takes a value, positive value of a certain magnitude to the ratio that it takes a, prob that it takes a probability of a negative fluctuation of the same magnitude, that is the ratio we are developing here. So the only difference is, whereas Jorge wrote sigma, sigma sub tau, I'm writing sigma sub tau equals a certain particular value. And then from there, I'm developing, so the value taking A, B, C, D, and so on, OK? All right, so. You said that you are going to comment on the fact that it can be a Gaussian ah, distribution. Ah, good point. So. That's a good point. The Gaussian distribution, actually, you can show, trivially satisfies the fluctuation relation. I know some of the theorists will not be happy to hear this. I got many angry emails when I made this remark in a paper. Let me explain why. So let's say 
my probability distribution goes as e to the minus, right? Yeah, right? So if I ask, what is the probability that this will take a plus value to minus value, this is already sitting inside it, right? So this is gone. Now if I take the ratio of the positive and the, uh, so the left and the right tails of the distribution, so this distribution is not centered about zero. It's not centered about there. It is it's coming out something like that, right? So I'm going like that. So a lot of effort, many initial experiments either did not get enough statistics or they got fluctuations that were, that were Gaussian distributed which trivially satisfies the fluctuation relation through this. So there was a hunt on for, for systems that give us strongly non-Gaussian distributions. And the first one to my recollection, and this has been many years, was of an experiment by Narayanan Menon and Klebert Feitosa, published in PRL 2004 or 2005. They took uh, basically a, a, a system of granular disks and they vibrated them from the boundaries. And so these balls or disks were going about like billiard balls, going and banging across the walls, etc. And they were measuring the power fluctuations. When they measured the power fluctuations, they got distributions. Now I'm plotting it in a log scale. So they were measuring power, so I'll just call it So in, in the log linear scale, a Gaussian will look like a parabola, right? But at very short time, so this was for tau, the averaging time tau, very short, right? Maybe a couple of correlation times. But when they went to say 10 correlation times or 20 correlation times, the fluctuations were smoothing enough to give them a Gaussian distribution. So this was the first experiment to my knowledge that gave uh, an experimental handle on verifying whether the fluctuation relation works for a non-Gaussian distribution. The other problem was, as I said, getting the negative fluctuations. You don't get enough statistics here, so how are you going to verify it? So you have to take long time series, large amounts of data, and hope that you're collecting enough statistics on the negative tail to be able to verify it. So uh, just to be clear, so the statement that you are making is that uh, for a Gaussian, the log of the ratio of these two probability is linear yes. anyhow. Yes. It's trivial. Okay, so... And the, the ratio is essentially mu divided by sigma squared. Yes. The, I mean, the, the slope is mu divided yeah. by sigma squared. So the experiment we did was we had a tank, large tank of water, one meter by one meter, filled with water to a depth of 30 centimeters. And we had a bunch of pumps, uh, sorry, we had an eight horsepower pump that recirculated the water from the tank and reintroduced it through a bunch of sprinklers. So if you look at it from the side, it looked like Or if you look at it from above, a bunch of sprinklers. So the water comes in through here and comes out like a jet. So the sprinklers rotate and they generate a sustained turbulence in the tank from the bottom. And you have water filled to the top. The problem is the intensity of turbulence in this 
tank and the water goes out from a pipe at the bottom through eight horsepower pump and is injected back, okay? The problem is the turbulence intensity is a strong function of the height. As I go, as I move up, the intensity of turbulence is falling down. So you make measurements somewhere in between or it, should, it shouldn't be so close that you're feeling the effect of the forcing the water that is coming out like a jet, but it, you should have enough churning of the water and enough intensity to get strong fluctuations. What we did was actually put particles that naturally float at the surface. So these are hollow glass particles that are naturally buoyant. So they look like foam or creamer in a coffee cup. Uh, before it mixes, if it's bad creamer. And so you're churning from below, but you're not, you're driving it hard enough to get strong fluctuations, but not so hard that you get waves. It's more or less flat. At t equals zero, you introduce particles, and you take fast camera recordings at 1,000 frames per second, 2,000 frames per second, and you track the particles to construct the velocity field. So now I have the velocity, what we call the Eulerian field, the velocity field of this whole thing. The problem with this is the water the, is incompressible, the flow is incompressible, right? But the system of particles that are floating on the surface of water, they form a compressible system because they can't follow the water molecules into the bulk. So they always, so if, if you naively imagine you're setting up some convection rolls, the Particles will always flee these upwellings, and they will always cluster around these downwellings. So if you look at it from above, this distribution will, of particles will look like a cluster. The measure is concentrated, if you want to talk about it in terms of measure theory. So one of the assumptions that went into the galavati cohen uh, relation was that the dynamics of these particles in phase space follows a particular kind of distribution clustering, which is known as the sinai ruel -Bowen, bowen statistics, SRB statistics. This statistics is supposed to have, uh, what is it, smooth along the unstable manifold and a fractal measure along the transverse direction. That was the starting point for me. I had no clue. I just stuck onto that and asked, can I just test this distribution of these particles in the steady state floating on my turbulent sea? Do they have a smooth distribution along the unstable manifold, and do they have a fractal structure? Close enough. I didn't get fractal. I got multifractal. So what? It's still better than anything anybody has done with phase space. Now, because this system is the next, the next point of correspondence between phase space dynamics and the system of particles on the free surface uh, was, in equilibrium, if I take an ensemble of experimental systems that are in equilibrium, like a cup of water in this room at temperature, 25 Celsius or whatever, and I make a measurement on all of them. Each one of them is in a different point of phase space, but if I superimpose all of them onto the same phase space, they are uniformly distributed. But if I take an ensemble or hundreds of such experiments that are turbulent at the same Reynolds number or same driving, same forcing, same identical conditions, the particles are not going to be uniformly distributed. They're going to be clustered at different points. That was the point they were making. Which is to say that the dynamics of phase points in phase space follows a hydrodynamic evolution of the compressible kind when the system is out of equilibrium. This is related to the divergence term in the, uh, in, the in the probability continuity equation, right? So if I measure the divergence of the flow of water, I will get zero divergence because this is incompressible flow. But if I, take the div if I measure the divergence of the particles, I get a non-zero divergence because the particles are clustering, the divergence is negative, okay? So let me call... I'll call it omega. Omega in fluid dynamics is usually uh, used for uh, entropy or the, sorry, the, the vorticity. But here it is 
the two dimensional divergence of the free surface. And now, if you say that I am going to take the distribution of these particles and I am going to call it n0 log n0 as the entropy of the system at time t equals 0. I started at t equals 0 with a uniform distribution of particles. I have the velocity field that I got from the experiment. Now I am doing a, a computer simulation using an experimentally obtained velocity field. So I am running Lagrangian trajectories, as we call them, of surrogate particles on, on this velocity field. And I am asking, so if I look from above on the surface, and if these particles are distributed in this funky way, I take one particle and I ask, how does it reach this clustering? So let's say I have one particle, and, but the one here will go to another cluster, assuming the cluster is here and something like that. But these are the particle trajectories. So I'm basically following each particle trajectory. And at every instant in time, I'm asking, what is the divergence of velocity at that point for that trajectory? This is actually, if I do the correspondence between this 2D flow and the phase space, this divergence is like a local entropy production rate. So using that correspondence, then we ran the machinery of the, so I told you I'm aware of only one experiment where we could do a correspondence with a two-dimensional phase space and ask, does the fluctuation relation work then? It was terrifying for me and for Galavorti because there are no free parameters of this kind. Either it works or it doesn't work. So, uh, uh, so you measure this, uh, how do you measure this uh, divergence in the sense that you have the position of the particles, right? So to compute the uh, gradients. Think of it this yeah. way. Huh? I'm, I'm measuring the velocity field at every point in space on the, on the surface. So, but you don't have particles in every point in space. Sorry? You don't have particles in every... When I did every... the experiment, I had particles that were uniformly distributed, and I was sampling every point in space, because these were neutrally... Yes, but this then when they cluster, they, you don't have... Yes. Yeah. So what I do with the clustered particles is, I'm asking with the velocity field that I, comp uh, I obtained from experiment, if I now constrain the particles to remain only at the surface, so initially I did the experiment with particles that, were, that did not have this constraint. They could pop to the surface, they could go into the bulk with every water molecule. That means they are divergence free. It's an incompressible flow. But now if I put in by fiat that I want particles that are stuck to the surface. So even though the three-dimensional flow is divergence free, the two-dimensional uh, system of particles behaves like a compressible system. And so for that, which is another way of saying, if I compute the three-dimensional divergence, that is zero. But if I compute two-dimensional divergence, so it's not zero. This is purely by fiat, because I said I'm constraining the particles to live on the surface only. Yes. So this. What, what is, uh, yes. Well, so I have are. the velocity field, so I can compute these gradients. And from yeah. there, I pull out the divergence. OK. So once I have that, I can then, I collected data over something like 200 correlation times, so what we call in turbulence the large eddy turnover time. And from there, sorry, 200, it was many more than that. I can't remember the exact number now. But it took me something like seven months to collect just the data. Now I define the entropy. If I define the entropy as a local concentration of the particles, and I can evolve this in time. So I can, so I'm starting at t equals 0, and I'm asking how does entropy change with time. Now I can do that, or I can do it through the divergence. This is directly giving me an entropy production rate. This is not related in any way to the thermodynamic entropy production rate. It's because this is not, a, first of all, there is not a system that is close to thermal equilibrium where temperature is well defined. This is also not a system that is, it, it's not a global measurement. I'm locally sampling. And third, I am 
looking at a real physical system as an instantiation of phase space. So I'm drawing a mathematical analogy. So this entropy rate actually turns out more closely related to what we call the kolmogorov sinai entropy rate, the way this whole mathematics work out. I won't go into the details, but if you're curious, you can go and look it up. And when we did this, we were able to basically, when I plot this left-hand side and ask how do the points fall, they fall on one straight line up to a certain point. So it goes and then deviates. And it deviates at a time, uh, at a, a value of divergence where my errors just start blowing up, which means it is setting the limit on the tolerance of my measurement. So isn't that uh, the uh, point where uh, your distribution becomes non-Gaussian? Actually, no. As the my distribution was strongly peaked. It was non-Gaussian. It, it was strongly peaked. I don't have the connector. I would have showed, shown the plots. But uh, it was one of the, it was the second experiment that had a strongly non-Gaussian distribution. This was basically, we have to ask how many standard deviations out we are going? How many? How many standard deviations or how many mean shifts? One moment. Because we are dividing by, so this is a, yeah, we are asking how many mean shifts. So we went six mean shifts. So it's not possible for experiments to go out to so many mean shifts normally. That, which means you need a really fat tail distribution. Gaussian wouldn't go that far. I'm sorry if I have confused you even more. <laughs> Perhaps one thing that is worth discussing is uh, well, two things. Uh, one is um, what are experiments testing? Um, because um, if we derive something on the basis of laws of which we have no doubt whatsoever, um, one could ask, uh, well, here is a context that is in the limit, no? so you are testing something. But many of the experiments where they use very few particles in a bath, etc., it's not very clear what they are testing because nobody doubts Newton's equations or things like that. So. Uh, some of the experiments are reproductions of just uh, exhibitions of a, of a result that is not under doubt. It's not like when you're trying to measure if the top quark exists, that a priori you don't know if it exists. Here, a priori you in principle know. So there has been a lot of experimental activity which was uh, not clear what, it was demonstrative more than uh, experimental physics, no? Yes. And then okay. the second thing is that uh, it would be nice that you tell people how disappointed you were about the usefulness for turbulence of this theorem. So, uh, just, so in the end, what did I learn about turbulence? I really did not learn much. I changed the Reynolds number and I asked myself, does this, does it in some way change uh, uh, sigma? Also, I couldn't understand why do I get a very strongly non-Gaussian distribution, and where does why did this whole machinery work? It was one stupid, simple-minded, experimental PhD students uh, dreaming that oh, I see these particles floating on a free surface. They seem to have correspondence with what the mathematical physicists have uh, said would be the distribution of phase points in phase space and the strongly driven conditions. Who said science is done by analogy so easily? There was no reason for it to work. So it bothered me why it worked. So I was hired for my postdoc at Los Alamos to work on granular systems. So I left turbulence in disappointed because I don't get I don't get the feeling that I have solved something every time I do an experiment. So I went to Los Alamos and I was chatting with a good friend of mine, Colum Connaughton, uh, who led to who later went to Warwick Mathematics. And we both got together and did 
he did the simulation and I did the analysis of the data. And we finally understood why the distribution turned out so, to be so strongly non-Gaussian. And this is a point I forgot to mention. I said earlier that X of tau, which is a proxy for entropy rate, if it is something like dissipation or power, it is rarely going to be Gaussian. And yet, most of the early experiments saw Gaussian fluctuations. And that they were dismissed for that reason. They were not, not dismissed, but it did not settle the issue. So here's what we did. This was a simulation of turbulence in two dimensions. There is such a thing. So the atmosphere is considered an approximation of two-dimensional flow because the thickness is much smaller than the lateral extent of the. In experiments, we do it in soap films because the thickness of the soap film is of the order of 10 microns, whereas the width and the length is of the order of a meter. So you have, let's say, a two-dimensional plane, a fluid, two-dimensional fluid, and you are somehow generating turbulence. The way we uh, generate turbulence in uh, two-dimensional flows, uh, there are two ways. One is what we call gravity-assisted soap films, where we basically take a nozzle and send soap solution, and we have two nylon wires that come down, and they're hanging from a weight, the kind of weight you use in gyms for weightlifting. So it's under tension. And then I pull these two apart. So this will now look So these are strings that are pulling apart. So I have pulled these two strings apart, and I have a soap solution, uh, soap film here with the solution flowing down the film. So it is like a quasi two-dimensional soap film. Then you take a comb, the comb you use to comb your hair. You stick it into the film. So if you stick it in from the front, you'll get turbulence downstream. Okay. The other way is done through what we call electromagnetic forcing. What people do there is you have a bunch of alternating magnets. So if one is pointing north, the other south, north, south, north, south. And you have a square or a hexagonal lattice of these. And you have a thin layer of salt solution, brine. which is floating on an even thinner layer of a dielectric fluid. Typically, this dielectric fluid is used in diffusion pumps in low temperature physics. So why? Because you have to separate out the metal bottom where the mag magnets are from the conducting fluid, which is a salt. And then you apply an AC current that keeps alternating. So it applies. So if your magnetic field is pointing this way, if the electric field is pointing this way, there is a Lorentz force acting some other way, right? And that will start churning the salt water, and you get turbulence. So that was the one we simulated. We had this set up in the lab at Los Alamos. We took that and did a simulation. And we, what we measured was we assumed that the force is Gaussian distributed. So we put it by fiat. We we put it by force. We decided a priori the force is Gaussian distributed. And we are measuring the velocity. So if I evolve a particle that is going about in this 2D turbulent flow, at every instant in time, I'm measuring. So I'm sampling at equal intervals of time. But these points are not equally spaced because sometimes the particle accelerates, sometimes it decelerates, so they are not equally spaced in space. So I'm getting two time series, f of t and v of t. And Jorge has shown us that f dot v, the scalar product, divided by temperature would be what? Entropy rate, right? But f dot v is power, right? So I have the power fluctuations, what we call Lagrangian power. This, so this is a Lagrangian trajectory, as we call it. So I'm measuring the local power fluctuations in this 2D turbulent flow as I go about. 
So if I, if I now, I have said that that is velocity, force. I have said that my force is normally distributed, my velocity is normally distributed. I'm plotting it in log log, log scale so that this looks like a parabola. So if my force is Gaussian normally distributed, velocity is uh, normally distributed. And if I'm defining P of t as f of t dotted with v of t at the same time, the product of two normally distributed random variables, what would that distribution be? So we first figured out and wrote a paper on what would be the statistics of that. Turns out it was worked on by a mathematician by the name of Craig, and it goes by the name of Craig's xy distribution. This distribution has some funny features. So here I call it p of t. I can call it x of t equals, so or z of t equals x dot y. So it has, it is very sharply peaked about zero. It's actually a logarithmically diverging cusp. So this is very strongly non-Gaussian. Second, the asymmetry, the skewness of this distribution depends upon the instant, the coefficient of instantaneous cross correlation between these two quantities. So it is possible to mathematically derive all these properties. He had shown this. So once we know we can control the asymmetry, it becomes a game now for us to increase the probability of negative fluctuations versus positive fluctuations. Why? Because both these quantities, even though this quantity is positive always, I'm always dumping energy into the system, this quantity can fluctuate positive and negative. But by controlling the instantaneous correlation between these two, by turning some knob, I'm now able to increase the probability of viewing negative fluctuations. Because we knew the functional form of this distribution, thanks to Dr. Craig from 1938 or 1936, we could actually calculate the large deviation function and predict what would be the entropy production rate, even though we were not working with entropy rate to begin with, and even though we can't define a temperature for this strongly driven system. And that is when I realized, oh, this is all falling out of statistics. So I'm not learning anything about the physics as a result. In a way, I am learning, as I pointed out, which is the time reversal symmetry breaking and the degree to which it is breaking. But beyond that, I am not learning much more. And that was the disappointing part. I'm sorry, I could have shown you the plots, but I don't have the adapter with me. Oh, we went longer than. OK, done. No questions? I finally get claps. No, yeah, I, used to, I used to think, oh, I'm yes. always in the info lab.